Hello. In this clip from our Justia webinar, Sarah Frug and Craig Newton, co-directors of the Legal Information Institute at Cornell Law School, will explore the future and the ramifications of law with the advances in the digital world and the arrival of AI platforms. If you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. We will finish up here where we want to talk briefly about the ramifications of all this. With respect to the online legal research you do now, whether it's in free databases or on platforms to which you subscribe, I hope you're already thinking about, for example, how some of the challenges Sarah described could impact problems you've encountered or what you've perceived as holes in collections or features that you'd like to see either on free or sometimes even paid legal research platforms. Whether you're comparing the outputs of different courts or different federal agencies or entirely different states and their various courts, agencies, and legislatures, I trust it's clear that the lack of standardization makes it very difficult to create purely technical solutions to gathering, processing, sorting, and displaying in a useful way everything that's being produced and, more importantly, everything that you might be hoping to find when you find yourself needing primary legal materials to answer your research questions. Similarly, with the material I presented on copyright, you can imagine, for instance, the state of play when LexisNexis owned and enforced what it believed to be a valid copyright in the official code of Georgia annotated. What kind of license terms did it dictate to other legal publishers if it agreed to license that content at all? And what would those other publishers do if they couldn't get or couldn't afford that license? You can't be charging lawyers in Atlanta to use your legal research platform and simply say, sorry, we don't have the actual law of the state of Georgia because Lexis has an exclusive deal with the state there. But what I really hope you'll think about after we're done here shortly is the implications on this AI revolution we've all been hearing about and we're all being told will completely reshape what we do and don't do as lawyers going forward. I know there are plenty of other webinars that will teach you about how AI systems, including legal AI systems work. And I'm sure some of you know a little something about the large language models they use, or at least aware that these LLMs exist and play a crucial role. So think about how these copyright cases potentially imperil the data sets on which large language models feed, and thus the completeness of the models themselves, as well as the quality of their outputs in a legal services context. It's clear that the various tech companies who pretty much harvested the entire open internet to create these LLMs completely ignored copyright. Will that come back to be the undoing of the whole thing? I also know that everybody has a legal AI product either already out there or in beta or coming soon. Here's the aforementioned case text. And here's what TR was saying about AI before it bought case text. Uh, this is the LexisNexis uh, AI product. And lastly, this is VLEX, which now owns FastCase, which I'd imagine many of you use as a Bar Association member benefit. And I don't think it requires either tremendous expertise or tremendous imagination to see the implications if the courts say that copyrights and standards incorporated by reference, for example, are valid and sufficient to prevent others from publishing or even making copies of those standards. I also think it's controversial to posit that the advice one can get from, say, an AI-powered expert system for regulatory compliance is going to be much better if it can actually quote you the standard your explosion-proof plug must meet compared to the advice from a system that avoids copyright issues but by providing instead a summary of that standard or tells you to go look up the standard yourself or helpfully offers you a link to where you can buy NFPA 70 for the low, low price of $145.50. Now, we talked about fair use and the concept of transformative use. There are some recently filed cases regarding image generating AI that haven't really gotten going yet, but may ultimately decide this very issue of whether feeding copyrighted stuff into generative AI as a matter of law is sufficiently transformative to justify ignoring the valid copyrights into that stuff. And very, very recently, the comedian actor and author Sarah Silverman and others filed a pair of class action lawsuits against OpenAI and Meta seeking to enforce the copyright in their books that have allegedly been fed into LLMs despite their presumptively valid copyright. Now, I, I earlier posited the hypothetical question is, is this copyright issue what's going to bring AI down? And the answer to that question is probably not. Uh, given some cases I mentioned earlier, 
such as the Authors Guild v. Google case about the digitizing of books, and especially the Google v. Oracle case about JavaScript copying. Transformative use doesn't seem to be a particular close question, but the Supreme Court did something in May of 2023 when in a case involving Andy Warhol's work, it reversed a trend that seemed to be expanding fair use that maybe will have us someday looking back at Google v. Oracle as perhaps something of a high watermark. On the slide, you see a screen cap from a SCOTUS blog article. The court held that the picture on the left, which was licensed by Warhol's estate to the Condé Nast group for a magazine cover and was Warhol's interpretation of a photo of Prince on the right taken and owned by Lynn Goldsmith was not fair use of the Goldsmith's photo. In doing so, it, the court took the concept of transformative use quite literally and said that both the Goldsmith photo of Prince and the Warhol version were both photographs suitable for licensing by the magazine. In other words, the magazine could have accomplished the same commercial purpose by licensing the original photo, so there was nothing transformative about its licensing of the Warhol version. Instead, the dissent focused on the transformative artistic elements of the Warhol's of the Warhol work itself, since after all, that's where the alleged infringement lay and not the subsequent commercial use of that work in the form of a magazine cover. Still, in light of Authors Guild v. Google and Google v. Oracle, I don't really think at the end of the day that the Warhol decision changes the likely outcome of any of the litigation around AI and copyright that actually exists now or might exist in the near future. And I've spoken with others who are watching all this and, and they agree. But it may well change the risk calculus for all involved parties or potential parties and thus alter their conduct in ways both predictable and not. I wonder, for example, if the advice that Sarah Silverman was getting from her lawyers about suing Meta and OpenAI changed after the Warhol decision came out. Meanwhile, legal uncertainty could slow investment in our adoption of legal AI systems. We'll leave for another day the question of how we feel about that, because that's our time for today. And we're, we're happy now to take any questions that you have. Wonderful. Thank you, Craig and Sarah, for joining us today. So it looks like we've already got a couple questions here, but if you do have questions for Craig and Sarah, feel free to submit them through that Q&A button at the control panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll go ahead and dive right in. So our first question is, is there a difference between the information I can get as a lawyer when using free research sites like Justia or LII rather than paid sites like Westlaw? I'm going to start here, but I will be brief because my technologist view is, is limited. Um, my, my perspective is that from a publishing standpoint, the primary difference should be the incorporation into commercial services of particular collections of original content uh, like treatises uh, that they have licensed. Um, and as Craig was discussing, this is a bit bigger than it sounds because licensed content inevitably provides training data for artificial intelligence work, and that's unavailable to the free services and proprietary to each commercial service that is licensing the content. Um, in practice, the differences tend to be about budget, uh, both the publishers and, and your own. Um, regarding publishers' budgets, though, uh, commercial services, and this is not something I'm sure everyone is entirely aware of, um, but historically they've applied a lot of editorial effort to manually maintaining very rapidly changing primary law collections and gap filling which is a resource that free of services have either used automated techniques to address primarily or haven't been able to address entirely at all. So from our perspective uh, as, a, as a free and open access to law publisher, uh, the, on the commercial side, they get to fill gaps with large amounts of money. Um, but I'll stop here because Craig's experience as a, in, in legal practice um, is, is key here. Thanks. Well, no, Sarah, I, I, I think you nailed it. Um, I would add just a couple of points, uh, small points. Uh, one being that uh, there is a, a, an optimism and a, and a temptation to think that technology can close the gap in some of the uh, secondary sources. Uh, AI, so legal AI systems or chat GPT or however you want to think about it are actually pretty good already at summarizing and categorizing like content. So the idea of 
seeding every case ever into some sort of machine designed specifically to process all that stuff that then spits out something that's kind of like the West Key number system, which is, of course, manually curated by lots of uh, editors with law degrees uh, in Minnesota uh, and probably other places. Uh, yeah, that, that could actually happen. And, and Sarah, you touched on this briefly in terms of uh, the quality of the training data that's that's used to build that machine. And, and if you own those, the, the best secondary sources, so in California, stuff like the rudder guide, stuff like Witkin, right? Um, if you own that and can incorporate that into your training materials, then, then you have a little bit of advantage. The other part of that, and actually just the uh, uh, CEO, Tim Stanley, is the first one I've heard mention this, is uh, the large commercial publishers also have an advantage in terms of they have you know proprietary control over all of their data about how users work through their materials so they can see how users jump from primary law to the secondary sources that they own and back how they use their key number system in the case of westlaw how they use shepherds or, or um, key site i guess it's called in westlaw um and they can they can build tools that uh that sort of um account for that right right from the bat whereas the rest of us uh would would have to sort of do that iteratively um so yeah that that's really kind of all, all i have to add to that in, ter in terms of nuance but yeah just just to re-emphasize the headline it's really i don't think there's anything primary law wise that's not available for free now uh if, if you know your if you know your stuff and if it's not if not for free then maybe through like your your fast case subscription which is which is practically free as a as a member of the bar, most places. Uh, so it's really, it's really the secondary stuff. And then how that, as we've talked about a little bit, how that secondary stuff then can sort of snowball. Perfect. Thank you both for that insight. Um, our next question is, what would you consider to be the biggest improvement the government can make to the process of creating statutes and regulations? Uh, I think on this one, since uh, on the publishing side, it's it's the technical crew that experiences most of the pain of uh, the current publishing practices. Um, I'd say my biases are, are pretty clear. I think I made them pretty clear in my presentation. It, essentially, my perspective is that if you need to know something to understand your legal obligations, then the government should be publishing that information. Um, but more specifically, I'd headline by saying that the biggest improvement the government could make would be stepping back to proceed on the assumption that the law that it publishes needs to be relied upon and reused, which means not only free publication, but open publication. Um, and that includes using data standards that have been developed for government data and providing a final official timely version of the law as it stands at any given point in time including annotation with external information about whether the law is actually in effect as written. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just use the excuse to reiterate the quote from uh, Kirsten Gullickson at the U.S. House of Representatives, because it's just that good. Um, that government data should be accessible, accurate, complete, described, free, machine readable, permanent, searchable, timely, and usable. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, it looks like our last question that we have time for today is, do you feel mostly optimistic or mostly pessimistic about the direction the case law on copyright claims by private entities in this context is going? Yeah, I, I guess I guess that's for me. Um, well, optimistic versus pessimistic is, is a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, an odd lens to look at it because I guess it depends on, on what you want to do with it or, or who your clients are or whatever. But, and I've gotten in trouble with this for, for, before, uh, but I'm generally, you know, kind of pessimistic because um, as, I, as I noted in my talk, right now there are, for example, three cases that are all dealing with a very, very similar issue about inc standards incorporated by reference and whether, whether those are in the public domain or whether fair use uh, applies or all the stuff I just talked about. Um, but those are three different courts in three different jurisdictions that are dealing with different fact patterns, different standards that were developed differently, that have been incorporated into the law differently in ways that may or may not uh, impact the, the the fair use analysis 
The same with can PRO as a nonprofit do something that Upcodes as a for-profit company can't do under the fair use analysis. I touched on that a little bit. So the idea that where all of this is going to end in two years or three years or five years or 10 years uh, is with a uniform uh, standard that applies everywhere uh, because all the courts have agreed kind of regardless of the details that the analysis comes out a certain way is, is far fetched. And I, and I think most of the practitioners here that have all kinds of specialties can think of several areas in their, in their uh, practice where, where that's true and where it would be really helpful to get some congressional action. And, and here's where my sort of background as a, uh, somebody that does a lot of patent uh, litigation or did a lot of patent litigation work and whose uh, former colleagues and, and current friends are still a lot of patent litigators uh, who have been just begging for Congress to do something um, in patent reform just to clarify the clarify the playing field because the legal landscape created by the federal circuits kind of all over the place. Um, the same could be said, you know, kind of for copyright. Um, and in fact, the Georgia VPRO case where I spent a lot of time uh, the court did something it's been doing increasingly in, in the Roberts court era, which is saying, if you don't like it, your gripe is with Congress. Tell tell your, you know, write your Congress person and tell them to do something. Um, so, you know, you can't be optimistic about that. If you, if you've ever practiced in an area of law where congressional clarification would be useful. So, you know, you know, sad to say, you know, overall pessimism, but it, in terms of simply, do I think that these courts are probably going to find at least fair use, if not public domain, then, then yeah, I, I think it's going to kind of work out, but it's going to, as I mentioned briefly, it's going to have kind of all sorts of strange little twists and turns and, and unintended uh, consequences along the way. Well, thank you, Craig and Sarah, and thank you all for your questions. Um, that's about the, all the time we have today. So Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more law practice and legal marketing videos. See you in our next clip.